<laughs> Looks like supernatural is the order of the day, eh, fiends? CK told you a werewolf story, so I'll tell you one about vampires. Welcome to the Walt of Horror. This is your Walt Keeper shrieking, and I call this blood-curdling tale from my bloody collection. Midnight Mess. The clock in the steeple of the village hall chimed five as Harold Madison moved across the square from the railroad station. In the distance, the train whistled off into the gathering twilight. Harold gazed up at the clock tower, still echoing the last chime, looked around at the quaint buildings lining the square, and chuckled. Huh, this is just the kind of burg my sister would be happy in. What a dead-looking place. The village square was strangely deserted. Harold set down his valise and scratched his head. Nobody around, no cabs, no nothing. Well, how in blazes will I find my sister's house? All I know is the address. A nervous-looking old man came out of one of the small stores, locked the door, and hurried across the square towards Harold. He kept looking around as if he were being followed. Harold called to him. Hey, hey, you, where's Shore Street? 1223 Shore Street? Eh, Shore Street, west, uh, two blocks, then east, three, but you better hurry, it's getting dark. The nervous old man trotted on past Harold, not even stopping for an instant. So it's getting dark, so what? You're a stranger here, aren't you? You don't know about them. No, I don't. Uh, know about what? The vampires! The... who? The vampires? Oh, come on. Better hurry. It'll be sundown soon. Vampires come out after sundown. Then the old man was gone up a narrow alley. Held laughed and continued on across the square. A sign caught his eye. Ah, a restaurant. I could do with a bite to eat. I am starved. The restaurant was small, but the mirrored wall at the far end made it appear much larger than it actually was. Except for one or two people who were finishing their meals, the place was empty. A waiter came forward. I'm uh, sorry, sir, but we are closing. It's almost dark, you know. What the... you two? What if it is getting dark? It's dinner time and I'm hungry. The waiter shook his head. We close in order that our help may get home before sundown, sir. The vampires, you know. Vampires? What vampires? For a moment, the waiter stared at Harold. Then his eyes fell to his suitcase. Oh, you're a stranger here. Then you do not know what is happening. No, I don't. What's this all about? There have been seventeen cases so far. Bodies found with every drop of blood drained out of them. The whole town is in the grip of fear. It's the work of vampires. Bah! No such thing. Nevertheless, I suggest that you get to where you're going before it becomes dark and the vampires begin to roam the streets looking for a victim. Okay, okay, I'm going. Where's 1223 Shore Street? Can you tell me that? Oh, of course, west two blocks, then east three. Good night. Good night. Everybody in this town nuts. Vampires. Ah. Harold stalked through the town toward his sister's house. As he went, he could hear doors being locked and bolted, blinds being drawn, and finally... Yes, who's out there? Donna, it's me. Harold, your brother. Harold's sister threw open the door. Harold, you... you weren't out there in the dark. Oh, no, Donna, don't tell me you believe in this vampire business, too. Donna locked and bolted the door behind Harold and turned to face him, her eyes wide in terror. Of course I believe in the vampires. Seventeen villagers murdered already. Blood drained. What else could have done it? Donna, there's no such things as vampires. They're myths. Perhaps, perhaps there's a homicidal maniac loose in the town. Certainly there must be a logical explanation, but not vampires. It's ridiculous. All right, Harold, believe what you want to believe. Now, let's forget about it. Come inside and tell me why the surprise visit. Well, I was on my way to the coast, and I thought I'd drop in on you. It's good to see you, Harold. You're looking well. That night, Harold Madison could not sleep. He tossed and turned on the cot Don had set up for him. Finally, he got up and dressed. Eh, I guess I'll go for a walk. Out into the deserted streets, Harold moved, down silent, dark sidewalks, toward the village square. Vampires. Every door, every window that Harold passed was locked up tight and dark. The village square was empty and silent. Not a soul out. They sure roll up this town tiring a drum after dark. 
and then he heard it, the laughter and the gay chatter. It came from a familiar building. Well, I'll be the restaurant I was in this afternoon. It's open. There's people going in. The restaurant was all lit up. People sat at tables, talking and eating. Harold went in. That's why I couldn't sleep. I was hungry. I guess I'll have something to eat. Harold sat down at a table. He looked around at the people seated near him. A waiter approached, a different one than the one he'd spoken to earlier. Hmm, certainly are some queer-looking characters out this time of night. Will you have the dinner, sir, or would you? The waiter looked at Harold with dark, piercing eyes. Harold smiled uncomfortably. Oh, uh, the, uh, the dinner will be fine. Um, what's the menu tonight? Juice, soup, roast with French fries, coffee, sherbet. Harold licked his lips. Good, say. I am hungry. <laughs> I'll be right back. The waiter went away and came back with a glass of juice. Ah, tomato juice. Very funny. Harold sipped the chilled juice in the glass. It tasted saltier than usual, and thinner. Ugh. Ah, well, can't expect too much from a small-town restaurant. The waiter's looking at me. I'd better finish it. The soup was hot, but it too was saltier than Harold would have liked. Hmm. Strangest tasting bullion I've ever had. Richer than usual, too. Do you like your roast clots well done or medium? Roast. What? Clots. Roast blood clots. Say, who are you? Blood! Oh my. Oh! Draw the curtain! Draw the curtain! There's an intruder in our midst! And then. Harold noticed that the mirror on the back wall of the restaurant was curtained, and now the curtain was being opened. Oh, good Lord! The restaurant was crowded with people, and yet in the reflection in the mirror, Harold sat alone in the place. Only, only I cast a reflection! The rest! Suddenly they were around him, the other customers, fangs bared, coming at him. The rest are vampires! Donna elbowed her way through the crowd. Harold, I told you not to go out. I told you. Now it's too late. T Donna, what are you doing here? I'm one of them, Harold. I'm a vampire, too. Why did you think I came to this town? I had to. It was the only place I could go. But, but this restaurant, I don't, I don't understand. In the old days, humans hunted their own food, prepared it themselves. Vampires, too, in the legends, hunted their own victims. But now we, just like modern man, leave the hunting to the professionals. We leave the preparing to the professionals, too. You mean... This restaurant serves blood dishes, like a vegetarian restaurant serves vegetable dishes. Blood juice cocktail, hot blood consomme, roast blood clots, Seriously? French fried scabs, scabs. blood sherbet... Uh. I'm sorry, Harold. Like the other seventeen that wandered into this restaurant, you will have to be silenced. I can't save you. The tap! Bring the tap! Harold was lifted bodily by the giggling crowd of vampires while his sister looked on unconcernedly. One vampire brought a rope. Another, the tap. Tie his feet! String him up! A party! And so Harold was strung up, head down, the tap was inserted into his jugular vein, and each of the vampires came, one by one, and filled its glass. Ah, nothing like the real stuff. Ah, I'll say. <laughs> and that's the story, kiddies. That's what civilized vampires do these days. They dine in bloodetarian restaurants, open sundown to sunrise. Where is there one in your town, you ask? Well, some night, if you feel up to it, look for it. You can tell by the sign inside. It's in red and says, Positively no nipping the waiters. <laughs> the guy who started this chain of drinkeries is a vampire Barnum. He knows there's a sucker born every minute. <laughs> now, I'll turn you back to the Crypt Keeper. Bye. <laughs> and now that your appetites for horror have been sufficiently piqued by my fellow slime-slingers, 
CK and VK. It's time for me to feed you foul the fair. So hop into the haunt of fear, fiends, and your hostess in heaves, the old witch, will dish out the delicious delving into the delirious called morning mess. The cemetery lay silent beneath a cold moon that skipped in and out from behind dark clouds that raced along on a brisk November wind. Below, the muffled sound of digging echoed into the night. A man stood knee-deep in an excavation among the flat, plainly marked graves, anxiously sinking his spade into the soft earth and tossing it onto a growing pile beside him. Every so often, the man would stop his work, listen, and then, hearing nothing, continue digging. I thought there was something screwy about this whole setup right from the beginning. I felt it. Now I'm going to find out for sure. The man furiously spaded the black loam out of the ever-deepening hole, all the while mumbling to himself. The Grateful Hobo Society. Hm! Smelled funny from the start. An experienced reporter learns to <coughs> sense these things. <coughs> and I sensed it that first day <coughs> at the press conference in the mayor's office. I remember how pompous old Mayor Mert stood before us and wheezed out his announcement. Gentlemen, our fair city has long had the problem of disposing of its derelicts and homeless ones, who pass away with no friends or relatives to properly bury them. Heretofore, these wretched unfortunates have been laid to rest by our city in potter's fields maintained by your taxes. Now, this responsibility has been taken out of your city's hands, gentlemen. May I prevent Felix J. Copard, representative of the Grateful Hobo Society, who will tell you of the wonderful offer his organization has made, the offer I have graciously accepted. Mr. Copard? I remember shifty-eyed Mr. Copard, smiling, soft-spoken. Gentlemen, the Grateful Hobo's Outcasts and Unwanted Layaway Society, the Grateful Hobo Society for short, was formed by a group of successful business and professional men who felt that they owed a debt of gratitude to this fair city. All the members of this organization came to this city as down-and-outers, drifters, derelicts, or just plain bums. But here they found opportunity, here they found financial success, and so, in gratitude, they have banded together to aid and endow others less fortunate than themselves, other drifters and unwanted. They have purchased a small parcel of land in one of our city's suburbs, landscaped it, and have turned it into a cemetery. A beautiful cemetery, where the poor outcasts who have not been as fortunate as they may be led to final rest in dignity when they pass from our mortal world. The grateful hobos, who prefer to remain anonymous, have created an endowment fund through mutual contributions, with which all funeral and cemetery upkeep expenses will be met. No longer will your taxes be needed for this purpose. No longer will shoddy potter's fields mark the beauty of our fair city's surrounding countryside. No longer will... Yeah, it smelled pretty funny, all right. I remember listening to Mr. Copard rave on, expounding upon the wonderful group of philanthropists he represented, and I remember finally asking. Uh, my question, Mr. Copard, is, uh, why should a group of rich men suddenly become concerned about some derelict's funerals? I explain, sir, all of these men... Yes, yes, they were all once bums themselves, you explained that. But why wait until these derelicts die before helping them? Couldn't the money be put to better use by rehabilitating them while they're alive? The grateful hobos are all self-made men, sir. They received no help when they were down. The present condition of the derelict in our city does not concern these men. Let the derelict rise up as they have done. But when the derelict can no longer rise up, when he has passed on... Then let him be raised in final arrest. I still don't get it. I remember attending that first funeral and seeing the Grateful Hobo Society Cemetery for the first time. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Nice place, Sweeney. Yeah, beautiful. Almost pays to die penniless. And I remember in the years that followed, returning from time to time and seeing the rolling lawns with the simple grave markers. Hey, uh, how come no grave mounds? I only work here, mister. The society says this is the modern way a cemetery should look, so I do like they say. But after a while, the work of the Grateful Hobo Society became stale news, and I turned to other things. Then this morning, my editor called me in. Trini, you covered the opening of the Grateful Hobo Society Cemetery for Outcasts and Unwanted, didn't you? 
Yeah, Chief, what's up? Well, according to the old bit department, they're burying their thousandth derelict today. Do I can run out and cover it for us, huh? It ought to be worth a paragraph or two. Sure, Chief. Hey, did did you say the thousandth derelict? Yeah, why? But that's impossible. It, it couldn't be. Why couldn't it? It's been almost seven years. It's a big city. We got a lot of bums. You don't understand, Chief. I'll, uh, see you later. So I drove out there this morning. Something I can do for you. I'm swinging from the globe. Come out to cover the funeral today. Oh, well, see, well, the grave diggers are all over there now, preparing the grave. I'll just mosey over and watch, if you don't mind. I watched them dig the six-foot hole. Ugh, okay, that's it. Just in time, too. Here they come. I watched the whole ceremony. A few derelict friends of the departed one had come along to pay their last respects to their fellow. He was a swell fella. <laughs> After the ceremony, the gravediggers returned and shoveled the dirt back into the hole and mounded it up neatly. Yeah, that'll do. Come on! Hmm. After the gravediggers left, I stood a while looking out over the rolling lawns with their simple markers and the new fresh grave mound jutting out like a sore thumb. That's strange. Very strange. I started pacing. I paced along the gate on the west side of the cemetery. Then I paced along the gate on the right side. I'm right. I know I'm right. Then I went back to the car. I started scratching away on my memo pad, figuring. Just what I thought. There is not enough area in that cemetery for a thousand graves. There was something fishy about this setup, and I knew it. I took a last look at the single mound amid the greenery. They must be stacking them, one above the other, unless... And drove to a nearby shopping section. I stopped at a hardware store. Yeah, I'd like to buy a spade. I drove back to the cemetery and hid my car. I scaled the fence, picked a hiding place, watching it all grow dark. I'll find out. I'll find out what this is all about. And then something happened, something weird and frightening. The mound, the single grave mound, sunk down into the earth, sunk down until it was level with the surrounding grass. Good Lord! The cemetery lay silent me, the cold moon. The muffled sounds of digging echoed into the night. The man mumbled to himself as he dug furiously. So I'll find out what this is all about. I'll find out. Uh, why should a grave mound just uh, sink down? Uh, just vanish? Why? The sound of metal striking metal reverberated from the deep hole the man had dug. He looked around, confused. Metal? That's funny. The coffin was wood. Hey, I'm a good six feet down. I should have hit the coffin long ago. This isn't the coffin. The man cleared the soil away from the metal floor of the grave. The coffin is gone! This is a door, a door that opens downward. The man stood up in the grave. He stared at the old house nearby, beyond the cemetery gates. There were lights on inside it, shining through shaded windows. Now I get it. Now I get it. The grateful hobos. Wah! Suddenly the metal floor beneath the man's feet collapsed and he plummeted downward. Good evening, Mr. Sweeney. I thought I heard you knocking. Copard! It is too bad you discovered our little secret, Mr. Sweeney. This, this is how you can bury a thousand bodies in a cemetery that couldn't hold six hundred. Exactly, Mr. Sweeney. And now, if you will lead the way, minding this gun I have here, <laughs> I will show you our intricate underground network. But why? Why all this? As a matter of fact, Mr. Sweeney, we got the idea from a comic magazine. <laughs> Uh, notice that there is a steel trap door beneath each grave location. All this eliminates digging, you see. That's why the mound sunk down. Uh, you say you got the idea from a comic magazine? Oh, yes, a horror magazine. Tales from the Crypt, I believe. In it was a story called Midnight Mess. Up those stairs, please. Midnight Mess? What was it about? It was about an organization of vampires who established a restaurant where they could get the blood they needed. Through that door, please. The Grateful Hobos are vampires! Oh, no, Mr. Sweeney. We merely applied the story to our own needs. All we did was buy this house and, uh, in there, please. Oh, good lord! There were twenty or thirty of them, 
sitting around the huge banquet table, patting their mouths with their napkins. <laughs> Meet of the grateful hobos, outcasts, and unwanted layaway society, Mr. Sweeney. <sniffs> we are what our initials stand for. Uh, G H O U L S. Ra ra reen, sis boom bean, stick him in the ash can. His bones are picked clean. <laughs> yeah, that's the organization's cheer creeps. No joking. <laughs> and now it's time to put out the fire under my cruddy cauldron and close the door to my reeking restaurant. For tasty terror tidbits. We'll all see you next in the vault of horror. Till then, get your dime's worth. Read this whole rag over again. <laughs> I dare you. Greetings, boils and ghouls. Welcome once again to the magazine voted I'd most like to be shipwrecked on a desert island with, if Marilyn Monroe were along too. <laughs> Well, there must be an honor in that somewhere. Anyway, it's your crypt keeper again, welcoming you to another slimy session of sickening selections, starting with this scream story, guaranteed to drive you notes. <laughs> it's a masterpiece of musical morbidity, a favorite of mine. I call this disgusting delving into delirium. Concerto for violin and werewolf. Sasha Barak, the famed concert violinist, clutched his precious Stradivarius protectively to his breast and cursed softly to himself as the old coach rumbled and bumped over the rutted road through the Romanian countryside. The old coach had been the only means of transportation available to Sasha. Taxi drivers had looked at him wide-eyed and turned away when he told them his destination, so he'd climbed into the ancient vehicle with its tight-lipped driver, and now, as he was being whipped and jostled about as it thundered into the night... Blast! These confounded Transylvanian highways are even worse than I remember them. If it weren't to see Vasily Yorga, I would never even attempt such a journey. The foam-flecked horse charged into the ominous black hills without slackening its mad pace. Sasha leaned from the coach window and shouted at the driver, who remained as he had been from the start of the trip, sullen and mute. Slow down, you fool! Do you want to get us both killed? So the famed violinist could only pray for safe deliverance to his destination. Soon the creaking, groaning coach clattered loudly over cobblestones. They were passing through a town that Sasha recognized. Chisasi! Thank heavens, only seven more miles to Bruja! The last seven miles between Chisasi and Bruja were even worse than what had gone before. The coach bounced and heaved over the pitted and scarred dirt road, but at last... So this is Bruja! No wonder they don't pave their road here! Only a fool would come to this godforsaken town now! Why, everything is moldering with decay and rot! <laughs> Only a fool, he says, pun my putrid pun, kiddies, but you've never seen such a fool as Sasha, risking his neck in a twenty-eight thousand dollar fiddle to reach this horrible hamlet. You'll see what I mean. Vasil Yorga lived in an ancient house at the edge of town. Sasha stood before the man he'd dreamed so long of seeing, but time had done its work on his old teacher. No, I don't recognize you. Who are you? What do you want? Maestro, is your old pupil, Sasha, Sasha Barak. Sasha almost wept as he looked at the face of his teacher, a face that had once been so handsome and powerful and noble, but now was withered and toothless with faded, watery eyes. Vasil was a mere shell of the strict, stern maestro Sasha had so long revered. Oh, forgive me, Sasha, I, I do not see you as well as I used to. How good of you to remember. How, oh, as if I could ever forget the man who recognized my talent when I was but a child and taught me all I know. Suddenly, Sasha noticed the old man stiffen, saw his face grow gray and his eyes fill with terror. Sasha, you should never have come to visit me here in Bruja. It is dangerous. Dangerous? Why, maestro? The old man looked around uneasily, then stared at his former pupil and whispered, Don't you remember, Sasha? This is Warwolf country. Don't you remember the incident that took place almost twenty years ago, when I was living in Chisasi, and you used to come to me for lessons? How could I? So many things have happened since. What incident? Don't you remember that young couple? They'd driven here from Budapest, impulsively risking a tour through the Transylvanian Alps. The rugged road between Chisasi and Bruja had proven too much for their motor car. Be patient, Marta. I will find the trouble in a moment. 
If you don't, I shall freeze in this mountain night air, Rudolph. A full moon had risen, filtering through the gnarled old trees, and an ominous silence had enveloped the lonely surrounding countryside. A rustling of nearby branches caused the woman to turn her head, and what she saw brought a soul-piercing scream from her throat. Rudolph! Ah! What is it, Martha? It was a war-wolf! It sprang upon the young woman, sinking its razor-sharp fangs into her soft white flesh, while the young man scrambled from beneath the car. <coughs> Martha! My God! As the young man came at the slobbering, snarling, bloodthirsty war-wolf, it fled, shaking with horror. He flung his lantern after the fleeing beast. The lantern shattered against a tree trunk, bursting into flames, and he saw by the sudden light his wife's arm dangling from the war wolf's drooling mouth. Oh! Don't you remember, Sasha? You heard the screams, the growls, the commotion outside. You wanted to go. Never mind, Sasha. Your debut is only two weeks off. We must practice. It is nothing. Get back to your music stand. But, Maestro, there must be something wrong. Look, men running with lanterns. Don't you remember the woman lying beside the car, her eyes staring, her face ashen, and her husband listening in horror to the words? She's dead. No, oh, oh, Lord, no. Maestro, what happened to her? Come away, Sasha, come away. The old teacher finished his story with a sigh. Sasha nursed that he was shaking and covered with sweat, and his toothless old mouth quivered. Don't you remember? Oh, yes, of course, Maestro, I do remember. But the explanation of the incident was simple enough. The woods are full of wolves. They've been known to attack a man. There have been more incidents, Sasha. Here, read this newspaper sent to me from Bucharest. Do you expect me to believe there is a werewolf here in Bruja? I ask you to believe this for the date. See the date? Nearly two months ago. Read. A member of Bucharest society played with his life last night when he ignored the warnings to stay away from the small transalvation in town of Bruja. There was a full moon, and his body, stripped of flesh, was found. The old man pointed to the article in the newspaper. There was a full moon, Sasha, a lycanthropic moon. In two days there'll be another. I beg of you, do not stay in Brusha. Nonsense, maestro. I am safe here as you are. If I am not welcome in your home, I will go to the inn, but I will not be frightened into leaving Brusha. The maestro shrugged his shoulders. Oh, you always were stubborn, Sasha. And I do want you to stay. It's just that at this time of the month and a stranger in town. Well, promise me you'll keep your bedroom windows and doors locked. Of course, maestro. I know how to take care of myself. Look. Sasha opened his suitcase and took out his revolver. I carry it to protect myself and my Stradivarius. A Stradivarius? <gasps> a genuine Stradivarius? Let me see. Old Vasil opened Sasha's violin case and drew forth the Stradivarius. He fondled it reverently as Sasha stared at his gun. Hmm. If I remember right, Maestro, legend has it that only a silver bullet can kill a werewolf. Beautiful. Beautiful. Eh, hey, Sasha? What are you thinking? Sasha's eyes narrowed. He smiled grimly. I'm thinking about killing me a werewolf, Vasil. Do you have an iron kettle I may use to melt down some silver? Oh, don't be a fool, Sasha. Why you risk your life? Ha <laughs> ha! I am no fool, maestro. Think of the publicity I will receive. Headlines in all the papers throughout Europe. Famed violinist frees a Romany town of a rampaging werewolf. You see, Vasil, there's more to success than mere genius. Even I must have publicity. So stop worrying about me. Tell you what, you may play my Stradivarius as long as I stay here. There. Now, get me that kettle. Sasha spent the next few hours in the cellar, melting down silver coins and pouring the molten silver into a mold he'd made by pressing the slug from an ordinary bullet into moist earth. As he worked, elegiac strains of a sad gypsy air played on the Stradivarius by the faltering hands of his old teacher filtered down from the parlor. Hmm, old boy can still play. When the silver slugs were cool, Sasha removed the lead slugs from the regular bullets and replaced the silver ones in the steel jacket. He ran upstairs, filled the chambers of his revolver with his handiwork, and placed the gun in his overcoat pocket. Ha <laughs> ha! There, maestro! Now I'm ready for the werewolf of Bruja! Ah, such tones, Sasha! Such mellow sounds come from this glorious instrument! The next morning, even though the old maestro warned him against it, Sasha walked into town. 
The sun beat down on the marketplace, but the warmth that brought was not enough to offset the cold, suspicious stares of the townsfolk. Hm, not a friendly face among them. The way they look at me, you'd think I was the werewolf. But there was more than suspicion and coldness in the townspeople's stares. Sasha seemed to sense a certain tenseness, perhaps hostility. He plunged his hands into the overcoat pockets, feeling for the reassuring steel of his revolver. Oh, my gun! It's gone! Sasha returned at once to Vasily Yorga's house. He was very upset and spoke excitedly to the old violin teacher. I thought it was accidental that someone jostled me when I first entered the marketplace, but now I realize that he must have stolen my gun. Do you know what that means, Vasil? One of your townspeople is the werewolf. Now that your gun is gone, perhaps you will leave. Sasha stared at his toothless maestro. Wait a minute. How did anyone know I had a gun? How did they know it was loaded with silver bullets? How could they? Vasil! You, yes, Sasha, I, it was I. I took the gun from your pocket and threw it down the well. It was only because I am afraid for you. The old man began to cry. I, I did it for your own good, Sasha. Now you are angry at me. Angry at you? No, maestro. I am touched by your concern for my safety, but I have no intention of leaving Bruja. That night, a gibbous moon, not quite full, bathed the old maestro's house in a cold, pale light. Inside, Sasha scanned a newspaper while Vasil played the valuable violin. Why is this last month's Bucharest journal, Vasil, and it came today? The mail is slow coming to Bruja, Sasha. You can understand. Sasha was well into the paper before a report caught his eye. He leapt up with a start. Vasil, listen to this. There was a full moon last night while five persons from Sisasi became drunk while celebrating a wedding anniversary and wandered into the ill-famed town of Bruja. A searching party found the five bodies the next day, outside the town. They had all been stripped of their flesh, bare skeletons, unidentifiable. Yes, Sasha, that happened last month. You see, it has happened so many times to so many hundreds of poor unfortunate people over the years that we here in Bruja are no longer shocked by it. Recall something I read on my last concert tour, Vasil. I wonder... Hmm, of course, how stupid of me. Tomorrow I am going into Chisasi for another gun. Early the next morning, Sasha Barak, the famed violinist, walked the seven miles to Chisasi in order to purchase the gun and bullets he needed. He carried his empty violin case. I should have guessed. Well, tonight the moon will be full and I will be waiting for them in the marketplace. It was past noon when he returned to Vasil's home. He grinned confidently as he showed the old man the gun he'd bought. And tonight I will go into town carrying my violin case. And who would suspect it conceals a gun? No one, of course. The rest of the afternoon was spent in the cellar, carefully molding bullets from molten silver. And when twilight was beginning to shroud the town, Sasha returned to the parlor with his silver ammunition, loaded his gun, and replaced it in the violin case. There, done, and... Good heavens, Vasil, don't you ever tire of playing the violin? Not this one, Sasha, not a Stradivarius. Besides, you said I could play it while you stayed. Sasha rested in his room, listening to the lilting strains of the violin. Suddenly, he felt Vasil's hand shaking him. It's almost time, Sasha. The moon is almost full. Come, let us go. Us? No, oh, sir, old man, you're staying here. You told me yourself it would be dangerous. But Vasil insisted he would follow Sasha anyway, so they walked into town together, above... The moon cast an eerie glow upon the cobblestone streets. The marketplace was deserted, yet Sasha was aware of a frightening presence, something he could only feel instinctively. The weight of the weapon in the violin case comforted him. And then, slowly, the frightening presence made itself known. The townspeople, all of the population of Bruja, began to appear from alleys and doorways and deep shadows. They all came towards Sasha and Vasil. And as they came, Sasha could see their red eyes glowing in the full moonlight, and the hair bristling on their faces, and their gleaming white fangs dripping spittle. He could see their snarling, drooling werewolf faces, and he retched in disgust. And then Sasha began to laugh. He knelt and placed the violin case on the cobblestones, fumbling with the latches. <laughs> I knew I was right when I read in the paper that five bodies were stripped of their flesh. I knew there had to be more than one werewolf. He shrieked shrilly at them, his words mingling with their low-throated growls. He opened the violin case. <laughs> and then I remembered a story I've read in an American comic book on my last concert tour. 
a story called Midnight Mess in a magazine called Tales from the Crypt about a town full of vampires. And I knew, I knew that Bruja was a town full of werewolves, and I knew I'd have to be ready for you. The snarling, howling beasts were almost upon him now, and their howling sounded like laughter, too. Sasha reached for the gun. Well, I am ready for you, all of you, because I've got a gun loaded with silver bullets. But not just any gun, a Thompson submachine gun! I'm ready for... Uh, oh, good lord! Sasha's laughter choked back in his throat, and the howling came up as the beast sprang upon him, for there was no submachine gun in his violin case, only a useless old Stradivarius. As flashing ruling teeth tore and ripped to board Sasha, he heard his old maestro's screaming voice. Careful of the violin, and save some soft part for a toothless old warwill. Remember, I brought him, I fixed things, I took out the gun. That's my violent violin piece, kiddies. Let it be a lesson to you. Don't fiddle around with werewolves or you might end up listening to a funeral march. If Sasha only had a better memory, he would have remembered that his old maestro always pulled a switch on him. You've heard the expression, beat me maestro, ate to the soda fountain. Bar was censored by a blue-nosed assistant editor we've got. Now, the vault keeper awaits. I'll dig you later. Meanwhile, I've got a tuba lesson, so I'll blow. Don't forget, the EC Fan Addict Club wants you. Even if no one else does. 